This is the meeting of the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission. It is Friday, October 26, 2012. I'm William L. Brown. I'm chairman of the commission. At this time, we will stand for the invocation. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this privilege of coming together, sharing in this meeting and in this fellowship. We thank you for this wonderful place that you have created that we all have the benefit of using. Pray that you will be with the commission, give us the ability to discern what is right, to make the correct decisions that will benefit all the men, women, and children of this state, that we will protect the resources, have the courage to enforce the decisions that we make. Guide us and direct us as we go through this meeting, for it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Barbara, would you call the roll, please? Jim Bledsoe. Here. Jim, Jim Bledsoe is present. Here. William Brown. Here. William Brown is present. Harold Cannon. Here. Harold Cannon is present. Bill Cox. Here. Bill Cox is present. Jeff Griggs. Here. Jeff Griggs is present. Jeff McMillan. Here. Jeff McMillan is present. Tom Rice. Here. Tom Rice is present. Jim Ripley. Jim Ripley is present. Julie Schuster. Here. Julie Schuster is present. Clayton Stout. Clayton Stout is not present. James Stroud. Here. James Stroud is present. Trey Teague. Here. Trey Teague is present. Jamie Woodson. Here. Jamie Woodson is present. Thank you. All right, do I hear, oh, well, let me first of all state, there is no committee meetings today. This is a commission meeting, so I will be con uh, calling on the various uh, people that will be making presentations today. Uh, since it is a commission meeting, anyone on the commission may ask questions during the presentation. Uh, you may also make a motion. Anyone can make a motion if if uh, the action is re it requires a motion and anyone can second the motion. Uh, that's not typically what we do when we have committee meetings, but since it's a full commission meeting today, uh, that's the way it will be handled. At this time, do I hear a motion with regard to approval of the minutes of the September meeting? So moved. I have, I have a motion and a second. All in favor, say aye. aye. Opposed, <laughs> no. Okay, the eyes have it. Um, make a few announcements. First of all, I wanna uh, thank Alan Peterson and all the members of his staff in Region 1 uh, for the great hospitality that they've showed the commission. Yesterday was a great day. We had the opportunity to go around in this region and visit a lot of the WMAs and a lot of the work that Alan and his staff have done and, and they've done a great job and uh, uh, hosted us for lunch which was great and also thank uh, Mike Hayes a former commissioner who has the Blue Bank Resort. Mike uh, hosted us last night to a fish fry and we've uh, stayed at the Blue Bank uh, Resort so all that's been great and we really appreciate the effort that you all have put forth. It's, it's been wonderful. Uh, I want to welcome, uh, I think, I don't know if Professor Eric Pellerin is here, but I understand his <laughs> biopolitical class from UT Martin is here. Are there some mm -hmm. students? Y'all stand up. Let's, we're, we're, we're glad to have you. I think at this time, uh, mm -hmm. Director Carter, we'll have the uh, presentation of the artist rendering of the White's Landing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Yesterday, we had the pleasure to go to White's Landing and uh, look at a site that the agency and the commission have decided to move forward on to, to build a, a new pier out there that would be handicap accessible, uh, redo the pier that's out there now to make it a little better than it is already in a multiple lane boat launch area. It's kind of 
a way to commemorate the 200 year celebration of, of White's Landing and, and also the 200 year celebration of Real Foot. And we thought that would be appropriate to kick that off. So we went out yesterday, had a little ceremonial groundbreaking. The money is in the budget to do that. And hopefully the work, we, we have gotten the permits as of day before yesterday to begin. So that work should start very soon. We had a couple of drawings and a couple of things, what we thought the area would look like. But we wanted to take the time today to, to kind of a little special presentation to for an artist's rendering of that area. And we'd like to make that presentation to the commission. But Debbie Broadbent is the featured artist who's here today. And she probably didn't want me to say this, but she, she also knows one of our fisheries biologists very well, Tim Broadbent. Uh, but Debbie is a featured artist from McKenzie, Tennessee, She's a watercolor and mixed media artist who is a member of the Tennessee Watercolor Society and a member of Nashville's Middle Tennessee Artist Society. She's also a council member of the McKenzie City Council and chairwoman of the Board of Northwest Tennessee Court-Appointed Special Advocate for Children. She's painted the artist watercolor rendering of White's Landing here at Real Foot, and she would like to make that presentation to the commissioners here today at this commission meeting in commemoration of the groundbreaking that we had yesterday into the Real Foot Lake Tourism Council for their new office location. As I mentioned, Debbie's married to, to Tim. They have three children, and she wanted to take this opportunity and thank you all for being a part of this and also for the 75th anniversary of the Tennessee State Parks and the 200 years of Real Foot. So with that, I'll introduce Debbie Broadbent. I carried it in with Tim's help. I wanted to thank you for allowing me to do this, and I really enjoyed it. It's been all over the house, and I've painted that for over a period of seven months just because I wasn't sure exactly what this area might look like. So this is actually my rendering of what this area, according to the drawings that we had. We've taken um, a little bit of liberty. There's some, not a lot of color from the water other than the water in the trees. So I really enjoyed doing this. It's a beautiful area. and. This is somewhere that I come frequently as a photographer also, and we do a lot of things here with a photography club that I'm a member of. So this is a beautiful area, and we're very pleased that we're getting some uh, notice here and that we're getting a lot of additional um, construction. So thank you very much, and I've enjoyed it. Thank you, Debbie. Thank you Debbie. We'll find a, a, a place of prominence to put that. I'd like to take it back to Nashville, but I'm guessing that the Region 1 folks are not going to let that happen. <laughs> but anyway, thank you very much for all you did. I failed to mention there will be a tablet that will be circulated throughout the room. Please sign your name, uh, where you're from. If, there, if you're representing a specific group, put down the name of the group that you're representing. Also, during the meeting, uh, if you want to make comments to the commission, you may do so at the time that the subject matter about which you're going to speak is being discussed uh, among the commission. If you would, please come to the front of the room, to the microphone, identify yourself, and then state your business. Thank you. Okay, at this time, we're going to go to uh, Bobby Wilson, Chief of Fisheries, for the Fisheries Award. Thank you, Chairman Brown. Um, last month, the Wildlife Division presented their awards for the Wildlife and the uh, Technician of the Year and the Wildlife Biologist of the Year, and it's my honor and privilege to be able to do so today. Um, we'll start with the Fisheries Technician, and the award goes to Jeff Sanders. Jeff has been a, a TWA employee at Flintville Hatchery for 25 years. 
He's carried the torch to two, excuse me, to three new hatchery managers during his tenure, ensuring that no loss of prior or critical knowledge regarding hatchery operations. This includes fish culture techniques, uh, 60 stocking site locations, as well as underground facility infrastructure. Jeff has been a foundation for Flintville hatchery operations, providing many ex excellent trout fishing opportunities for Tennessee anglers during his career. Jeff's demeanor is also perfect for Flintville and TWA. He is always friendly, courteous, enthusiastic, helpful, and hardworking. These characteristics make him a dedicated and irreplaceable employee. Jeff has always been superior in reference to his performance evaluations in all aspects of his job. He was promoted to Technician 2 in 2012. He serves as a lead technician to two other employees, a full-time and a part-time technician. He is a great teacher and role model for new employees and has helped train both of these employees this year. Jeff de Jeff's dedication was proven this past year when the hatchery staff was limited to just him and uh, the hatchery manager, Stacy Surgener. Jeff worked seven days per week without complaining uh, during the most critical and busy period of egg development and fry production phase, coupled with the rigid winter trout stock stocking schedule. Together, Jeff and Stacy kept trout production and winter stockings on schedule. Some of the 2012 accomplishments which are directly attributed to Jeff's efforts include Flintville, uh, the winter trap program, and spring stream stockings. This winter, 31,700 trout were stocked at 23 sites in 17 counties. During the spring, 51,300 trout were stocked in 35 streams from 21 counties. So a total of 135 stocking trips covered over 16,000 miles. Jeff's tireless efforts resorted, resorted in, excuse me, resulted in countless fishing trips and a lot of happiness for Tennessee anglers. He is a native of the Flintville, uh, Fayetteville community. He has been an ex excellent liaison between neighbors, the local community, and the hatchery. He has effectively communicated any issues that involve locals. An example was a recent July drought, which resulted in critical hatchery water flows and temporary closure of available spring water for the public. Jeff has been instrumental in communicating this circumstance and avoiding ill feelings from the community. Jeff has contributed to the management of the 350-acre Flintville Wildlife Management Area. He's planted food plots and maintained access to accommodate small and big game hunting opportunities. Jeff has also assisted with the Lincoln County Youth Hunts and Free Fishing Day events during his past year. So I'd like to present a plaque and award to uh, Jeff Sanders. <laughs> The next award goes to the 2012 Fisheries Biologist of the Year. And that award goes to Rick Bivens. Rick is a native of Blount County. He graduated from Friendsville High School in 1967. He went on to serve his country in the United States Navy between 1970 and 1974. After his tour of duty in the Navy, he began his college career at the University of Tennessee where he received a BS in Wildlife and Fisheries Science in 1978. Went on to graduate school at UT. He investigated brook trout distribution and history in Tennessee, documented most of brook trout populations that are known today, and led to the discovery of previously undocumented populations. His efforts have been the foundation for brook trout management in Tennessee and laid the groundwork for many brook trout restoration projects that have been accomplished over the years. Rick began his professional career with the TWA in 1980 as a creel clerk on Teleco and Fort Loudon Reservoirs. He spent the, the next six years exceptionally performing these duties until he was promoted in 1986 to a wildlife manager one. With his promotion, Rick was tasked with the responsibility of developing a regional stream survey unit, which would begin to build the knowledge base for stream resources in East Tennessee. His efforts with the program set the standard for data collection needs and techniques during his tenure in this position. In 1991, he was promoted to his current position as Wildlife Manager 3, where he is responsible for administering stream fisheries, trout management, and trout hatchery production programs within the region. In the early 1990s, he initiated the Southern Appalachian Brook Trout Hatchery at Teleco. His work here prepared the framework for rearing wild brook trout that would be used for restoration efforts throughout the region. 
The product of this work led to the reestablishment of brook trout in Sycamore Creek within the Teleco River watershed. The development of delayed harvest trout regulations was implemented first in East Tennessee under Rick's direction as led to the expansion of winter trout opportunities for the angling public. <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> Property Rick's most enduring quality is his humble. <coughs> Thought I, might make, might, thought I might make it through. <clears throat> I'm not choking up. <clears throat> I'm just choking. All right. <clears throat> Probably Rick's most enduring quality is his humble nature and attitude towards his work. <clears throat> he is always willing to assist with other agency functions and has always been an important cooperator with other resource agencies in developing management plans and actions within the region. His efforts over the past 30 years have led to a better understanding and management of Tennessee's aquatic resources through the development of monitoring stocking programs and documenting the region's aquatic taxa. Rick Bivens, would you please come forward and get your award? Next, we'll go to the Wildlife Officer of the Year presentation. I don't think, thank you, Commissioner Brown. Uh, I don't know what Bobby's excuse is, but I have an excuse. My drainage is killing me today, so I will try my best to get through this. But y'all gentlemen just shook Bobby's hand. I suggest you go wash it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, uh, and, and on top of that, my brother gave me some kind of pill with a cup of coffee, and man, this room is spinning right now. <laughs> but uh, the Boating and Law Enforcement Division would like to recognize Tennessee's Southeastern Off uh, Officer of the Year Award, and that award is to Ray Garden. Officer Garden is assigned to Hardin County, but also works to 12 counties throughout District 12, and he's part of Region 1's District 12 and he also has the ability to work all those counties inside the district. Ray's teamwork and outreach efforts were outstanding. He writes weekly articles for two county newspapers, conducts radio and television spots for local stations. <clears throat> Garden Gate, I see I'm losing my voice. Garden Gate programs at a local school utilizing the bone box, and what that focuses on is fur bears, and they bring the pelts and the skulls and let the kids learn, learn those animals. He spoke at a Hardin County Farm Day. He set up a deer scoring and informational pro booth at the Hunter's Night Out. Garden also assists with two programs, Hunting for the Cure, and for the, he also uh, coordinates a, a Hardin County Youth Deer Hunt. His efforts in excellence and innovation were also great. He developed a new aquatic habitat program for both the Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts, and their goal was to take these kids out to the creek where they bring their nets and seines and they, they dig up creatures and critters and they go back and try to identify all the new aquatic species that they've learned. He also works with Eagle Scouts in the local area and tries to, uh, he does a survey program to kind of get a feel for how many birds are in the area. And another neat program he conducts is an after school fishing program. Not only one, he spends one day in the classroom with the kids, but the second day's uh, spent out on the pond fishing so he actually gets them out there to fish. His attitude and leadership efforts are also to be commended. He coordinates an enforcement detail this year in his area with both uh, Alabama and Mississippi to focus on some boating issues that was happening down on Pickwick Lake. Uh, in his four county area, he also has leaned towards his expertise on his investigative skills and his knowledge of the area to put those work for enforcement details together. Garton uh, really exceeded in his achievements and confidence for this year. 
he became a certified Boone and Crockett scorer. That was a week-long school he attended, so he could score North, uh, North American Big Game. He also attended a, a courtroom testimony course on his own. He made 172 field contacts. Those are 172 hunters, 407 anglers, 438 boaters, and these contacts resulted in 95 citations and assisted other officers on 75 citations. These citations included nine big game with 16 assists, six small game with 12 assists, 31 sport fishing with 30 assists, 42 boating with 14 assists, and seven miscellaneous. Uh, another thing that I'd like to recognize uh, Officer Garten is he just recently promoted to sergeant, so he's now a sergeant for our agency. And I'd like to recognize his captain, Captain Brian Elkins, and also his uh, major, which is Major Thompson. So I'd like to recognize, and more importantly, his wife. And uh, we all know how important they are to allow the, our guys to get out in the field and do the work they do without the sport at home. So this year's winner is uh, Ray Garden. Thank you, Ray. Oh, I, I forgot to tell you, he, he was wine and dine a couple months, uh, well, a couple weeks ago in Hot Springs, Arkansas for the Southeastern Association Conference. So he attended all the law enforcement technical sessions and there were some good uh, topics there. So hopefully he can bring some of that back home and teach our guys with. Well, you can't, you can't get them in front of the podium, can you? They just insist on standing back in the corner. Congratulations, Ray. All right, at this time, I want to call on Director Carter to uh, make a presentation of a resolution. <laughs> that probably should. Well, you know, when you get two chiefs both going through puberty at the same time. <laughs> So, <laughs> over. I knew that that term would be stricken from the record. <laughs> I had the opportunity. Of, I serve as the awards chair for the Southeastern Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies in over in Hot Springs, Arkansas. I was presenting the the awards to the officers of the year from the southeastern states, and things didn't go quite right as you might imagine. And after it was over, Ray said, I don't know where to be embarrassed or, or proud. So <laughs> he never did answer which he was. But, but last, uh, at the last commission meeting, you remember we talked about the Scholastic Clay Target Program that a lot of schools in Tennessee participate in. And we had some young men that, show, that came to the, that meeting, and we recognized them at the time. And honestly, until after the meeting was over, I really didn't recognize what all they had done. So we asked their coach and, and some of the team members if they could come back today so that we could properly let you know and the public know what these young men had done and the outstanding contributions they've made to the program and to their local area. So with that being said, I'd like to propose the resolution honoring the Henry County, and I love this name, the No Fly Zone Rookie Skeet Team and the No Fly Zone Rookie Trap Team. The resolution reads as follows. Whereas increasing participation in outdoor recreation is a worthy goal, especially in those programs which involve young people, and whereas participation in the shooting sports program teaches not only safety but expertise, teamwork, self-esteem, and self-discipline, and whereas Tennessee has over 80 scholastic clay target programs, boasting more than 1,800 youth participants who have constantly excelled on the national level of prominence, and whereas the Henry County No-Fly Zone rookie skeet team consisting of Zach Cole, Drew James, and Stuart Archer performed like veteran shooters by winning first place in the 2012 regional skeet competition at the Holly Fork Shooting Complex with a com combined score of 235 out of 300 targets and further excelled by winning the state rookie skeet championship in Nashville. Whereas these same shooters demonstrated their extraordinary shooting ability by shooting on the, the no-fly zone rookie trap team as well, which further excelled by winning the Region 1 rookie trap team competition, also at Holly Springs, 
And whereas the no-fly zone rookie skeet team was vaulted into national prominence in Sparta, Illinois, by capturing the Scholastic Clay Target Program National Championship rookie division, with Stuart Archer and Drew James placing second and third, respectively, on the national level. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency and the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission, meeting this 26th day of October in Real Foot, Tennessee, offers its most sincere congratulations and appreciation for a job exceedingly well done to the Henry County No-Fly Zone Rookie Skeet Team for their excellent shooting ability and their sterling role as ambassadors for the state of Tennessee, and be it further resolved that the Tennessee Wildlife Resources Agency and the Tennessee Fish and Wildlife Commission offer special recognition and praise for the team coaches Bill Neese and TWRA Wildlife Technician Ronnie Cole for their personal effort in coaching and supporting these young men and achieving the success at the highest possible level in every aspect of the team and its members. Ronnie, if, if you and your team members would come up, we'd certainly like to present you with this. And Mr. Chairman, if you'd like to join us. Be sure that the tablet, I think I saw one be left on a chair somewhere, be sure the tablet circulates throughout the room and everybody signs it. All right, at this time we're going to the wildlife management and uh, call on John Gregory. John's regional manager of Region 4. Thank you, Chairman Brown, rest of the commission. I'd like to just give you a brief uh, kind of update on, on the elk program and our hunt uh, that we had just finished last weekend. Get it up. I started out a little just uh, for the new commissioners, a little bit of background of how we got to where we were. I wasn't going to spend a lot of time on that. I'm not the best person to do that. If you want more of that, I can bring Steve Bennett, who's our biologist uh, in the North Cumberland area of the elk, where the elk zone is at. So I'll uh, just give you a little brief where it started. Yes, come here. Just, just a brief history, like I said, uh, TWRA started a, a discussions about reintroducing elk in Tennessee uh, in 1996. Uh, went through a lot of uh, work with the, the local farm bureaus and, and, and the local public and set up a, a zone uh, around the North Cumberland Wildlife Management Area, which is north of Knoxville, for those of you who don't know where it's at. Uh, it's, now it's about uh, 150,000 acres of land that the public has access to in that area. Uh, the first release occurred in December of 2000. And since that date, we've had five releases, a total of 201 elk were released. Uh, we had originally planned to have a lot more releases and more animals put on the ground. 
uh, but some issues uh, between uh, the United States and Canada and uh, where they didn't want the animals being moved uh, across the border kind of shut that down. The last uh, few releases came from Land Between the Lakes uh, elk program. We do do estimates uh, to try to determine what the population is out there now and we're estimating that we have 400 plus animals on the ground now. First hunt was done in 2009 and since that time we've had uh, hunts every fall uh, with a five bull limit uh, until this year and we added a juvenile uh, permit uh, for another bull uh, for the juvenile hunt. I want to just go through uh, the success we had. Uh, Tony Fink of Crossville, he was our first harvest this year. He harvested on the opening morning, Monday of uh, last week. Uh, it was a seven by six that weighed 642 pounds. Uh, one of the things I wanted to show about this picture, I, I, as all the regional managers are proud of our guys and how they come up with ways of doing things, they've had struggling trying to figure out how to weigh these elk. They went to Lowe's or Home Depot, bought one of those bags that you put your debris in and can somebody will come by and pick it up. $25, it'll hold 3,000 pounds. They can lay the elk in there, lift it up, and, and get a good weight on it. So save the backs of probably several of my employees. Whoops. Uh, that evening, actually our first juvenile that wasn't picked on the juvenile hunt killed the first, uh, his first elk. It was a seven by six, 580 pounds. Uh, Corbin Moore, uh, I know when the first elk came in in the morning, Steve was glad it was killed in the morning because if it's killed in the evening, it's a late night. I heard uh, Corbin's elk was after 11 o'clock before they got done weighing it in. So it was a long day that first day of the hunt. Next day, on Tuesday, Walt Kimberlin of Kingston killed a six by six, 569 pounds. Also on that day, Brian Rochelle of Franklin killed an eight by six, 620 pounds. This one has a little story. Uh, Steve Bennett, that I mentioned as the biologist, uh, sent me a note on it. Uh, this elk was released in 2002. It was a two-year-old elk. In 2004, we found it, uh, a man that uh, does exotic animal raising in Fentress County called us up and had, and had caught this in a pen of his and called us up to come get it. So in 2004, we went and got it, moved it back to North Cumberland and released it and, uh, and put a tag in it, number 29. And uh, we hadn't seen this animal until Mr. Rochelle harvested it in 2012. And it was within about three miles, air miles, of where it was released in 2004. So that 12-year-old uh, elk. And uh, Dwayne Marbury of Stanton killed a five by five, 424 pounds. We had two elk killed on Monday, and then three were killed on Tuesday. And the hunt went on through Friday, so the guys got to relax a little bit after Tuesday. Then on Saturday and Sunday was the juvenile hunt. Jessica Parkins of Greenville uh, was the lucky juvenile that was selected. And uh, on Saturday, the first day of her hunt, she killed this five by five, 311 pounds. So first year we had a five elk harvest and now we've broke the limit because we killed six this year. So uh, that's kind of an update of I think that was it. So, give you a, a little brief history of a successful hunt and, and a lot of happy people. We've got some real nice comments. We also did a, an orientation tape with uh, help from Todd and probably Lee and several others in the INE division in, in Nashville. Uh, we've got and gave that to the hunters. And I saw one email where the hunter said he. He really enjoyed it, it helped. He watched it several times before he went out on the ground. 
so that was our first year. We used, we'd have one-on-one -on -one, uh, sit-down orientations, but now we've, we've put it into a video format and we can give this it to, to the hunters that are successful in a, on a CD version. So work, work very well. Any, I don't know if I can answer any questions, but I'll try. Has there been any uh, problem as far as are we wounded any animals or the animals that we were pretty successful, the ones that went after that we got them all? Or? We had one animal last year that we know was hit and we didn't find, but that's the only time that we know that we've had an animal get away after being shot. That's great. That's, that's impressive. Yeah. Oh, I, I did want to go back to a pit. Again, I want to brag on my guys. Uh, I was that skid. I, it was sitting in the back of a trailer, and I asked about it. Uh, if you remember last week, Tony Hickel was my technician of the year for the agency. He's a, he's a master welder. He put that. Uh, it's a real heavy duty aluminum kind of sled that he put together to help again save some of my guys' backs on getting these elk out of the woods. And uh, I'm just constantly amazed on, on what they come up with uh, to make their job more efficient and better. So I just wanted to brag a little bit some more. So. And if I hit this. Mr. Chairman. I got a, I've got a question. I've got a couple of them. Um, do, John, do you know if, if the, uh, any comparisons have been done to the weights on our elk versus maybe Kentucky and sea hires are comparing to as far as size and, and, and the habitat and what effect it might have on the weights and that kind of thing. Those, those, those 12 year old elk that weighs five, 620 pounds is not real big and I just wonder how that's compared to, to Kentucky. Mr. Carr, I, I, I'm not, I, Steve probably could have answered that. I'm yeah. sure he keeps okay. up with that. I know he goes to, like the annual meeting of all the elk programs uh, in the different states, mm -hmm. and I'm sure they have some of those conversations, but I'm not, yeah. I'm not sure. And the second question, that uh, I was with some uh, Rocky Mountain Elk Foundation people the other night, and they had mentioned that Kentucky was trapping and, and, and uh, moving elk. They needed to get rid of some, and I wondered if we perhaps were going to move some more elk. I, I know we've benefited from some of their movement, but they were released on their side of the state line. But we, there's a, a Tackett Creek area, which is, uh, goes from North Cumberland on up to the Kentucky line and then on up into Kentucky. And we're getting reports of elk being there, and I know Steve went out this year uh, trying to see where they were concentrated to hopefully maybe uh, go dart a few, get some information from them to, to verify that, you know, they're not some of our elk that we released. But I think that we are benefiting from those movements, but we haven't actually had, you know, an agreement or whatever with Kentucky to bring any elk into Tennessee. But they're releasing them close enough to the line that we're benefiting. I think Kentucky's herd is much bigger than ours, isn't it? Oh yes, a much bigger. Thousand, isn't it? Several thousands. Yeah. yeah, yeah. But this weight that, that was given on this bull here, all these weights are still there, correct? That's correct. I know, you know, it's a major difference in, in the habitat. A lot of the elk are in those uh, mountain top removal areas of, of West Virginia, Kentucky, that, that part of the state, and uh, they are a grazing animal, and those mountain top removals pretty much make large grazing areas. And, and uh, you know, our elk, we, we work on benches and making food plots and things like that for them, but uh, you know they're they're learning to eat acorns and uh, 
So there's definitely difference in habitat, but I'd have to ask Steve if, if, if it's making a big difference or seeing a big difference in lakes. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, John. Appreciate you. I have the opportunity to go, go up down. Monday and visit <laughs> up there, and the guys are doing a great job up there. Okay, at this time, I'll call on Director Carter to make an introduction. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. If, if I could move back just for a second, I was so excited about the no-fly guys being here. I didn't ask for official action from from the commission so it would be a proper at this time if, if the commission would would move and to adopt that resolution so moved. Second. all right have a motion and a second all in favor of approving the resolution for the henry county no fly zone rookie championship skeet team say aye aye, aye. opposed no thank you thank you I want to mention just one other thing as well. When we talked about it, Mr. Pelvin's class a while ago, Eric Pelvin, the, the Dr. Pelvin's at the University of Tennessee Martin. He's also the son of a longtime fisheries biologist who retired in Region 2 several years ago, like I guess maybe eight, nine years ago. Yeah, Eric also has a son. He works with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, so they've carried on a family tradition there for quite some time between the Fish and Wildlife Service and the University of Tennessee Martin. So anyway, glad that, that the crew's here. The application for the for the phone, I, I was going to explain that to you, and I thought this would be a good chance for Nat to get some public speaking experience. <laughs> so, with with that in mind, uh, I'm going to ask Nat if he would explain this to. Us. Thank you, Reverend Nat. 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 Thank you, Reverend Well, what I want to do today is give you a, a brief overview of uh, something we're going to roll out in the spring. We want you all to be some of the first people to hear about it before we start really putting the publicity out about this uh, mobile harvest application that we developed. Now, what we've done is, is, is look at and see what the changing landscape is, see the advent of this technology that's come about, and, and try to avail ourselves to some of those things. Now. Uh, we looked at it, we've been looking at this for some time. There's been another state or two that's tried this. And what we wanted to do was be on the, what we call the leading edge of this technology, not on the bleeding edge of it, you know, which are the first people that go out and try it. Now this is, this is a real combined effort by four of the divisions in the agency, the IT division, the information and education division, law enforcement, and wildlife. And we've all met multiple times to try to come up with this and tweak this and make sure that we're getting the right information, that it's user friendly and it's gonna meet the needs of everybody that's out there. And this is gonna be a major change in the way that the agency processes harvest records and keeps, and, and, and keeps track of those as we go forward. Uh, I'm gonna give you just a little bit of overview of what the, uh, the app is gonna look like I'm not going to go through the whole thing. There's several steps to it. But the first thing that you'll get when you pull this application up, and this is going to be for both platforms, both the, 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 the Android and the, and the Apple platforms. Uh, the first thing you're going to get is, do you want to check in a big game? Do you want to go to our mobile license sales? And this is another thing that we're really pushing Active Outdoors for, is the implementation of not only mobile harvest application, but the license sales and there is a possibility that we could roll both of these out in the spring both the light mobile license sales and the harvest if we do that we will be one of the first states out there with more or less of an electronic license that's out there there's been some resistance between some other states we've talked about it but we hopefully we can pull pull this off and get both of these applications out there at the same time but definitely the mobile harvest will be available so what you're going to be able to do when you pull that first screen up is say, do you want to check in big game? Do you want to go to the license sales, which we're going to go ahead and put out there is coming soon? 
And then there's going to be a harvest log diary that you'll see that I think is kind of a, a unique feature of what we're going to have here. Now, <laughs> next thing you'll do, it, it'll simply ask you to identify yourself, this application is designed for those individuals who already have a TWRA ID. Uh, if you're in one of those situations, you're a landowner, uh, uh, you're a juvenile that does not require a license yet, and you don't have a TWRA ID, you're not going to be able to use this. But as soon as you get one, you will be able to do that. Uh, the next thing that comes up is just some more demographic information. Are you a resident? Are you a, a non-resident? And then it will go through at that point, once it identifies you, and gather all the biological data about the harvest. And I'm not going to go through all of that. But it gathers all the biological data off the harvest. Is it a deer? Is it a turkey? And then you go, you just branch down from which one of those species that you harvested down to describing all the biological data that we would gather. Now, the data that we gather here will be exactly the same data that will be gathered if you go to a POS station or the same data that we gather if you want to do this uh, from a desktop PC just going online and doing this. All these three things will go through and, and gather the same amount of data. And then what it does, it returns back to you this screen right here that gives you this confirmation number that you see across the top. And these, these are drafts, these are not the finals. That number will have a, a tag on it up there and that'll be the confirmation number. And then it lists you back all the, the demographic the, and the biological data about the harvest that you had right there. Okay. Then, the next thing it, it's going to do, well, I think we're getting a little bit unique. Then it presents at that time, here's your harvest log. Here's your electronic harvest log. And I'm going to talk a little bit later about what we see in the changes of, 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 of kill tags versus a harvest log. So what you'll have, if you check these in, you'll have then an electronic harvest log that you'll have right there that records every animal that you've harvested right now. And the feature that we think that I, I, I think is going to be real popular as we go forward, you can pick one of those, and let's just say you, you pick the bottom one there, and what we're going to do then is then bring up what we're going to call a diary. And you can record the details, a little story, this was my son's first deer that was harvested, we were on cousin Jimmy's farm, it was on April 22nd. And then that will always be stored with that harvest data right there. Uh, whenever you want to pull that back up, you can pull it back up and have that available to you. So, and this harvest log will be continual. So the rest of your hunting career you will have, you'll have that, that diary in there along with that log uh, and that's, uh, that you've developed as you go along. The, this requires really a, a re-engineering, a revamping of our harvest reporting requirements that we've always had. The use of kill tags, uh, those types of things. So what, we're, what we've got is a real opportunity to educate our hunters on a new way of going about uh, recording their harvest. And we're going to have a, a, a pretty energetic program to get this word out. We know that everybody doesn't just intently read every rule and regulation that we put out there, every hunter doesn't. So we're gonna give them multiple opportunities through multiple media and multiple fashions to be able to become aware of that. And, and what, this is, what this is gonna do is we're gonna roll this out partly with our new license sales and then partly with our, it will be actually implemented for the first time for harvest data for spring turkey. But your harvest log is you won't have to, you do not have to use this mobile app, but you do have to keep a harvest log, which but it, will, it will eliminate the use of the kill tag, but you will have to keep a harvest log. And starting with our new license sales, you will have printed on your license if you, if you buy a license that is in need of a harvest log, you will have a little harvest log printed actually on that license. But we're also going to make this available through several other forms uh, to be able to get those. We'll have it available on the internet. We're gonna put it in the hunting guides. 
uh, just about every piece of paper that we put out, every available means of contacting the agency, we're going to make that, that harvest log available to people. Uh, we've seen one other state that's a little bit ahead of us on the mobile harvest log. They developed an online step-by-step -step video about how to use this. We're going to do the same thing. It's, we feel it's a very intuitive application for those people who, who use mobile applications. It, it's very intuitive and it's just not going to be that difficult to learn. But we are going to put that out there. We're going we're to start previewing this in our hunting and fishing guides as they come about. We're going to put things in the magazine. Uh, we will start a, a series of press releases about it, uh, some opportunities for some PSAs. Uh, we'll use our wild side radio that's on WSN at 530. Uh, every morning and then once again we're going to jump ahead with a little bit of the technology of this QR codes and uh, for those of you who are like me and don't know what that is that's that little squiggly box that you see on stuff that you get this application on your phone and you click on it and uh, it takes you to all the information about it. I want to say that when we were talking about this the first time I'm not that technologically savvy and they said well, you just, you just put your phone on it, and you click on it, and it takes you to that web page. I said, well, I did it, and I took a picture of it, but it didn't do anything. So I said, nah, you don't have the right stuff. So, But there's a lot of people out there that do understand that, and that's, that's who we're targeting. But that's, uh, that's, uh, those are the multiple media that we're going to use to try to get this information out. But it is going to be a change. It's going to be a change in our tagging procedures to go to this harvest log, and it's going to give another avenue for people to to, to access that harvest log in a very quick fashion. Uh, it will cannot require connectivity. If you're in areas you don't have connectivity, it's not gonna work, it's not gonna store it and do it later. It's an interactive application because it has to make sure it's verifying who you are. But once again, it, it'll sync exactly with uh, the online version or the POS if you take it into a, to a harvest station. Now, what are we paying to get this? done we're not paying anything we're getting this done for free and the reason we're getting this done for free is our vendor for our license sales is a company called active outdoors and the hunt fish portion of their business is a very small piece of their business they're, they're, they <coughs> bought the company that did the hunt fish portion for Tennessee uh, out of a company out of California but they're very big in the organization of public events races, teams, they do uh, the registration for all the federal campgrounds. If you, you know, when they went to that several years ago, if y'all remember when they first did that, it was really a disaster, the first company that had it. I think these people have really straightened that out. But what they're wanting to do is, is gather information about the users of this application and what they do, what, what we're, we're, we've worked out with them is that once they've gotten through doing everything that they want to do with us, they, they can go to this last page right here and say, do you want to register with Active Outdoors? And what that will do is give them some contact information uh, to go back and register with them. But they're n under no way obligated to do that. And at the end, they can say, I don't want to do it. I'm through with it. And they're, and they're out of the application. But that's, that's how we're able to get this done for free because it gives them the opportunity to get some email addresses uh, to mark to some people. And what we're working with them is we will then get those email addresses for people that, 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 we, that we possibly would not have. Now, the thought is if you've gone through and done this, we're going to have your email address because part of what it does is when you go through, it says how do you want to be notified that this harvest was complete? and you can notify it by text or by email or by both. So we will get that information as we go through this application and get back with the people. Uh, it, is, it is, well, as of yesterday, our changes are, are finalized and it's gone, it's gone back to active, active Outdoors to complete uh, the, the, the final work on it. I, I don't have an actual mock-up. We had one for a little while, but we made so many changes in it. That we, that we didn't want to show it, but that really kind of, those first few screens will give you a little bit of a feel of what the layout is of the, what the screens are going to look like a, a, as we go forward with it. But uh, I, I think it's something that, that all the divisions working together have put a lot of effort into it, 
everybody just had their equal say in them, making sure that it came out to, to suit everybody's needs. But it, it's going to be a change from the way that we do harvest, but we think it's a really a good step in the right direction. So that's all I've got. If anybody got any questions, I'll anybody have try any to answer. questions or comments? I got one, Nat. Um, since it's done away with the kill tag, when they take it to the taxidermist or the processor, is there a way that they can log on and get their confirmation number to make sure it's a legal animal? The, the, the person who takes it, if they, our thinking is the person who checks in that animal using this mobile application and takes it to a processor, they're more than likely going to have a smartphone with them and they'll be able to pull up this harvest log in that confirmation number with them all the time. And they can give that to the processor. That, that was a discussion that came up uh, from law enforcement. I don't know if every bit of those details have been worked out about how, what we're going to ask them to do as far as recording harvest numbers, keep a log of them, put an, identif uh, an additional identification on it over and above that. But that confirmation number is going to be their verification it was a legal harvest. Anyone else? Yes. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, First, I want to commend the agency. I think that this is a very exciting opportunity for hunters. I think it's great that the divisions work together to figure out how to make this happen. The harvest log particularly is exciting for folks to see what their, what their story's been. It's a great way to keep up with some generational stories. I think it's fantastic. My question is, is for those who don't have an iPhone or a Droid and who perhaps aren't as technologically up, what, what would, would you walk us through what their process will be as you eliminate the kill tag and go straight to the harvest log? What will that look like for those folks? It, it, it's gonna look virtually the same. If you, if you, if you go to a, a POS station, if you, if you take your, take it into the uh, local gas station down there where you check your, they're gonna get a confirmation number back and it's going to be your responsibility then to keep that confirmation number with you. If, if you do it online, there's really not a whole lot of difference between what you get now. I mean, you've got the ability to print out a kill tag and that kind of thing, but it's going to give you a confirmation number, and you're going to have to keep up with that confirmation number as you go forward. It will go ahead and, and, and create you that log, right. but it, it's, it, it's going to be a change. It's going to be a change from what, what what we've done in the past. And we felt that, that moving <coughs> forward, going to this, this, this methodology. Now, a, as we said, you're gonna get on your license a harvest log that you can manually keep that up on. We're not gonna leave you out on your own to keep up with that confirmation number. When you get a license now, and let's say you buy uh, uh, you buy, you buy a sportsman's license or, you, you know, you buy your, your, your big game stamp, then the, the logic will say when you print that out, you're going to have a harvest log printed out on that license, and it'll have a place for you to put your confirmation number in there on that license. So that will have that harvest data. Not only will you have a physical copy of it written on your license, but it will also be in the system. Then the officer could go in and, and look it up. It sounds like, though, from a user-friendly nature of folks who may not be as technologically up on it, it's going to be just a different look of a sheet of paper they're going to have for confirmation, very user friendly, and I think it's a very exciting way to, to keep up with, with your harvest, so I very much appreciate what you all are doing. Thank you. It was, it, it was, it was a lot of give and take by everybody in trying to come up with this methodology, but I, I think everybody is fairly satisfied with this is going to work going forward. Thank you. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you. Nat, I just want to commend you because I know you've been working on this for a long time and uh, just the fact that you've had the persistence to get it done, it's pretty exciting. So I'm anxious to see it and I think it'll, it'll do a lot for the agency and for those that are out there hunting and fishing. So thank you. Thank you. The, you know, the, I, I, I push periodically, but it's really up to the, the other folks that are out there. Michael May stayed back, has really been pushing on this hard and his staff. And uh, getting everybody together, is re it's, it's really been good to get everybody together to see the work done on it. I've got one. 
uh, I think it's great too. Uh, uh, the way I understand, you're still going to be able to go and physically check a deer at a at a license agent or the real system. Absolutely. Okay. That's why you choose that. Not the only change will be you won't get a kill tag. You'll have that harvest log that'll be on your license, and you fill that confirmation number in on that harvest log. Yep. All right. In in the in the app, and I. I you probably have already discussed this, but you're are you going to try to expand this maybe to, to for navigation, for information about the various WMAs or opportunities to hunt and fish and do whatever, just a full information of what the what what you provide. What? Well, yes, that's what, that's exactly what we're doing. Just we weren't going to expose a lot of the details about that right now, but it's going to be wrapped hopefully wrapped up in a bigger application that that the, the best description I can give it of something that you might understand, get the context of it is like a pocket ranger. And the, there is a company that's done that for a lot of state parks and it will have boat ramps on it. It'll have sunrise, sunset tables. It'll have a tremendous amount of imp information on it. And with inside that TWRA app, you will have the ability to go to once we get the license sales up, you'll go, go to license sales, you'll be able to go to mobile harvest. But eventually all that's going to be wrapped up under a TWRA app, somewhat similar if you can envision something called a pocket ranger that's got a GPS technology in it. Most of the phones now are coming out with, the, with, with true GPS technology. It's not just uh, triangulation off cell phone towers, so they'll work even if you're out where you don't have coverage. So. A lot of that is going to be incorporated into it. We're hoping to have all that pulled together at the same time. I'm not saying for sure that we are, but it will eventually be, as I said, wrapped up within a TWRA application. It'll have several other pieces with it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I, I think I'm following up on Commissioner Cox's question. Uh, I want to say first, I think it's a fantastic idea, and I, I'm, I'm willing to bet that it's going to really improve compliance in terms of, of uh, checking big game because I think it's gonna make it so easy for the hunter. Um, but my question is this, I think there's a certain segment of the population still uh, that doesn't use computers at all. Uh, and I wanna be certain, and, and you may have touched on this, but I wanna be certain that that segment uh, can still use the methods that they're used to. They have a paper tag, they fix that to the animal and so forth and so on. Well, we're, we're not going to continue with the tagging aspect, but what we're going to continue with, as I said, when you get your license, if you get a license that's valid to hunt big game, you're going to get printed on that license a harvest log. And everything that we put out once we start rolling this out, it'll, it'll, you'll be able to print a harvest log off our website, it's going to be in our magazines, it's going to be in our newsletters, we're going to put it everywhere we can. So really what we're doing is replacing the, har the, the tag with the harvest log. So if, if you've got the ability to, 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 to use something that's online, you'll have that harvest log. If you just want to go to a checking station, you'll, if you have a license valid to harvest big game, you will have a harvest log on your license. And when you show that agent your license to, to, to to check that game in, you're going to have that log right there on that license. You can just fill out your confirmation number and put it on it. So the law is going to change where you can move that animal before you tag it and go to a check station to tag it in. You don't have a physical tag on the animal. We've got some, some tweaking to do on some of that, yes, sir. Thank you, Nat. Uh, all right, you. this time we're going to take a 15-minute break. So.